So good morning, all of you. Welcome to another lecture by you know, presented by Professor Academy. Uh, today's lecture is titled "Winged Creatures." You know the literary representation of birds. So in the earlier lecture titled "Something Fishy," we looked at the literary representation of fish, right? And today we'll go for birds. The advantage we have, you know, uh, through this lecture is that we can discuss literature across countries and across literary genres. So that's the advantage we have. And let's go to the first section of today's class titled Winged Creatures. Section one, wait for birds and words, subtitle, as bots are bird watchers. So that is a connection between, you know, um, those who watch or wait for birds and those who wait for words, poets. So that's the first one, ornithologists and wordsmiths. So here is a, a snippet from the Indian poet Nizam Ezekiel's poem, poet, lover, and bird watcher. Okay, there's no end here. So these are the words. The best poets wait for words. The hunt is not an exercise of will, but patient love relaxing on a hill to note the moment of a timid wing. So in this poem, poet, lover, bird watcher, Nizam Ezekiel compares, you know, three people, one poets, two lovers, three bird watchers. The essential thing or the commonality between these three is that patience, they have to patiently wait for something they want to achieve. Poets, wait for you know, words and lovers, they have to wait for you know, a signal from the lady love or the love. Then bird watchers, very, you know, they need patience to, you know, there is some sighting of a wing or a whistle from a bird. So ultimately they, will, they all will be rewarded, maybe in most cases. Sometimes they may not be rewarded, they have to wait forever. But once they get what they want and think uh, they are happy, you know, that's how this poet has come up with this poem, right? The best poet wait for words. And next one is from the French symbolist poet, Charles Baudelaire, the albatross. So here the bird is not compared, it's again compared with the poet. So in the earlier poem, the bird, versus the poet versus the bird watcher. Here is more about the bird is a symbol, of, you know, it's a symbol for the poet. Um, a poet, when he is among his people, in the sense of those who, you know, appreciate literature, those who, you know, love poetry, I think he's considered as a king, a prince. Whereas when he is among, or she is among common people, you know, those who are after material things, I think um, the poet is not considered a great being. So that's what happens to Albatross and that's what is happening to this poet represented here. So that's why, so earlier he's more like an aeroplane, not in the sky. So now he's grounded. So a grounded flyer. So look at this, the poet resembles the prince of the clouds. So, you know, it's a kind of a majestic being, both the Albatross and the poet who is friendly to the tempest and laughs at the bowman. Now they don't bother about the arrows, you know, uh, being shot at them. Uh, they elude all the criticism, you know, when they are in the air, the albatrosses and poets, but banished to ground in the midst of hootings, H-O-O-T-I-N-G-S, T-I-N-G-S. So hootings, now they are being criticized and his wings, those of a giant, hinder him from walking. The poet is very much aware of his talent and very much aware that he, you know, he doesn't belong here, you know, among people where, uh, you know, who, who don't bother about poetry or don't bother about literature. You know, they are after something else. So is an odd man out or odd woman out here? So that's a, a comparison here by Charles Baudelaire, The Albatross. Then again, 
let's go for a connection between birds and poets we have our own man the swan of avon so here is a poem by an elegy by ben johnson elizabethan poet so he wrote this elegy um title you know uh, to the memory of my beloved the author william shakespeare to the first folio published in 1623 so this how he writes sweet swan of avon what a sight it were to see thee in our waters it appear so ben johnson is actually talking about the native place of shakespeare he was born in stratford upon avon and why swan because in the river avon there were a lot of swans and the sweetest among them is uh, among them was shakespeare and that bird had come uh, to thames now so it's a kind of shakespeare leaving stratford for london now he is in london so ben johnson f- uh, feels honored by his presence so sweet swan of avon what sight it were to see the in our waters it appear and make those flights upon the banks of thames so here is a bird from the avon river and it has come to the thames and thames is known for its um, uh, you know beauty as well as its uh, history because look at the people who are uh, representing thames here that so did elizabeth i mean eliza and our james so queen elizabeth and james one so now he he belongs you know he belongs among you know among the royalty so that's what uh, ben johnson means so in the same poem he talks about a small latin and less greek despite uh, knowing small latin and less greek uh, shakespeare delivered in the london scene and that's his price and shakespeare left stratford in 1585 and he left for london we don't have enough evidence what happened in between you know the years uh, we call it lost years 1685 sorry 1585 and 1592 and 1592 we have a document a pamphlet by the university wit robert green grots worth of wit published in 1592 it's a, it's a it's an important document because this is how we come to know that shakespeare reached or uh, shakespeare is in london shakespeare was in london there and he was um, actually jolting many people because of his uh, through his wit so robert green calls shakespeare an upstart crow beautified with our feather feathers what does it mean so when we say say an upstart crow one who is very pompous a sh- a showy no uh, a showy person one one who shows off his talent or her talent but green also accuses shakespeare of plagiarism green says you are from a countryside and what you do you are just a crow but you beautify yourself by borrowing you know words uh, wings from university wits you do not have wit of your own you are a poor fellow so he called shakespeare a plagiarist but he was proved wrong later so that's the sentence here means an upstart crow beautified with our wings you do not have originality you borrow everything from us from thomas keats or marlow you are just a borrower you are not an original so that's an accusation against shakespeare by robert green but today we read more shakespeare than robert green uh, right but anyway why we respect robert green is for this documentation 1592 uh, you know that last year is over in the sense we do not have any evidence between uh, 1585 and 1592 we call this period uh, dark or uh, lost years and now that's over then we know shakespeare is shakespeare was there and shakespeare you know did something majestic in london again we'll go to the connection between birds and poets uh this time from the romantic poet john keats so john keats in his poem 
ode to a nighting girl writes like this away away for i will fly to thee not charioted by bacchus and his parts but on the viewless wings of poesy and he calls this bird nighting girl immortal bird now who is bacchus here bacchus is a god of wine and generally bacchus inspires poets and artists but kid says i am not inspired by bacchus today but i am inspired by the nighting girl and i don't need bacchus or his parts p a r t s parts here represents leopard right part leopard uh, which is uh, bacchus vehicle so john kid says no i am not bothered about uh, bacchus here uh, today so ave ave for i will fly to thee so i am coming to you bird not charioted by bacchus and his parts but on the viewless wings of poesy so through poetry i am going to reach you so he wants to be one with this beautiful bird called nightingale and he enjoys his music so he joins a kind of a chorus uh, with the nightingale through his words and this phrase is uh, uh, often quoted wings of poesy coined by john keats but maybe here a uh, kind of a suggestion right because uh, he takes um, a drink then he grows wings might be kind of uh, uh, coldrich who takes opium and grows wings of poesy so with this we finish section 1 so section 1 is all about you know you need patience and there's a comparison between um, birds bird watchers and poets and birds and poets and birds which inspire poets we'll go to section 2 uh, kind of a bit spiritual here pray to birds subtitle and be blessed we already looked at john milton's paradise regained the entire paradise regained in in an abridged form in a class so it was published in 1671 a companion piece to paradise lost so in paradise regain so in the opening act act 1 jesus was baptized and during baptism during his baptism we saw a bird a dove right and the dove represents the holy spirit so in christianity the presence of a dove represents the presence of the holy spirit so here is the son of god and blessed by the holy spirit so to his great baptism flocked and look look at the word flock because that is associated with birds and to to witness this baptism people flock and there are many uh, come around to this baptism uh, conducted by john the baptist so to his great baptism flocked with all the religious round and with them came from nazareth the son of joseph deemed to the flood jordan so they come to the river jordan and john the baptist you know he did the ceremony and during that time heaven opened and in likeness of a dove the spirit descended so the holy spirit descended in the form of a dove while the father's voice from heaven pronounced him his blessed son so here the bird is more associated with uh, god and spirituality here uh, more christianity too so whenever you come across a dove in literature especially uh, by a christian poet then the dove is not just a bird you know it's the holy spirit perhaps we can see this in another poem from the pre raphaelite poet dj rossetti's the blessed damsel again you can look at the word blessed so people are blessed by the holy spirit so in this this is uh, this is an interesting poem which is a reversal of uh, the american poet edgar allan poe's the raven the commonality between these two poems um, the lover died i mean the lady love is dead and there is someone mourning in a uh, poe's poem the raven you know there is a kind of um, melancholy 
felt by you know, the boy. Whereas here is from the point of view of the girl who is dead now, who is in heaven. And from her point of view, this uh, poem is written. So that's a major difference between the Raven and uh, the Blessed Damsel by D.G. Rossetti. So let's seek, seeking his grace. B2 will lie in the shadow of that living mystic tree. And here is the context. Now the lady love is dead and she has been in heaven for years. Um, she's tormented and she longs for um, her lover who is yet to reach uh, the heaven. So she imagines, okay, after a period of time, definitely my love will come to heaven. Once he comes, we will go to God and we will seek his blessing. And this is her imagination. So she says, we too will lie in the shadow of that living mystic tree. So in the heaven, there is a mystic tree, you know, tree of life. And in that tree of life, we, what we see is the Tao. Within whose secret growth, the Tao is sometimes felt to be while every leaf that his plumes touch saith his name audibly. So in this tree, we see the Tao. The Tao again represents the Holy Spirit. And whenever you know, the, its plume, you know, feathers touch any leaf, and the, any leaf, you know, that leaf utters a word, Christ, you know, saith his name audibly. And the late, in the later part of the poem, uh, she also imagines um, uh, that she will take the love and she will uh, take him to Jesus Christ and seek his blessing and also to Mother Mary, right? So that's the poem by DJ Rossetti, The Blessed Damsel. So in both the poems in John, John Milton's Paradise Regained and here, the dove is a symbol of Christ, uh, Christ or the Holy Spirit, specifically the Holy Spirit. We'll go to the next one. Again, we'll go for G.M. Hopkins, a priest poet. This poem is a bit different. It talks about, you know, spiritual crisis um, felt by G.M. Hopkins. G.M. Hopkins, as you know, was a priest, but he had this dilemma, like the protagonist of uh, James Joyce novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man. So in this, uh, sorry, in that novel, we have Stephen Detalus, who wants to be a priest, but he knows that he wants to be a poet. So there's a kind of a crisis to be a poet or to be a priest. The same problem was felt by um, J.M. Hopkins. And you might be aware that J.M. Hopkins burned most of his poems, considering writing poems might be a sin because uh, he thought he was indulging in pleasure. So he burned most of his poems, but uh, few survived and it was saved by his literary executor, Robert Bridges. So here is a poem which talks about his uh, inner crisis. The Wind Hover, subtitle, To Christ Our Lord. So what happens, the persona of this poem looks at a bird, right? The wind hover, a hawk, and enjoys, I mean, admires this balance. The bird hovers in the air and it has such perfect balance. The bird is aware what it is doing and it comes naturally to that bird. Whereas here is a guy who has taken the path to spirituality, but he struggles a lot. He doesn't have such balance, you know, by uh, maintained by the hawk. And he admires that, but at the same time, he talks to himself. What am I doing here? Look at the bird. So kind of an inspiration and also a reminder of his struggle. And we are aware of the terms introduced by G.M. Hopkins, uh, particularly two, inscape and in stress. Now, uh, these two words has joined uh, the literary terms in uh, when we analyze literature. So how do you, how to remember these two terms? Number one, when we say inscape, 
it's like a mindscape or inner scape a person's inner scape inner beauty so when we say in scape it represents someone's or even a bird or animal someone's essence or individuality so that is in scape so if you understand in scape as inner scape or you know kind of a landscape then you need not memorize a technical term so every being has some in scape in a sense their essence so here is a bird which has some essence in it so that is its in scape the hawk has some in scape what is in stress the word stress means effort so in stress represents the effort made by someone to understand that essence or individuality so we can say the person of the poem or gm hopkins himself makes that effort in stress so the in stress is all about how the poet or the person of the poem tries to understand the inner beauty of the hawk right now let's read the lines given here of the rolling level underneath him steady air so it talks about the balance maintained by the hawk in mid air and striding high there how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing so it's very smooth and it's not still it's just a wimpling wing in his ecstasy he is so happy the bird is very happy then off off forth on swing still it goes on and on but hawkins couldn't maintain that balance in his spiritual life so there is a crisis and this poem is all about that crisis so he dedicates this poem to christ our lord so we'll go to the next one let's go back to socrates the philosopher the greek philosopher we are aware shah socrates was accused of uh, impiety blasphemy and his death sentence he was asked to drink uh, hemlock and he died so before his death uh, he asked or uh, he asked crito one of his followers and friend said crito we owe a rooster to asclepius a s k l e p i o s who is asclepius asclepius was a god of medicine so here is a kind of a mockery or a kind of a paradox because what was the charge against the socrates blasphemy he was convicted of impiety but look at this a person who was convicted of impiety asked uh, his follower and friend to you know sacrifice a rooster to a god so it's like um, saying thank god i am an atheist so that kind of a paradox here another paradox uh, socrates says see you sentenced me to death but i don't see is a you no know, see death as a kind of a, you know punishment but a cure death is more of a cure for my diseased life so i welcome it so he mock the authorities and the entire concept we don't know whether it is a really blasphemy um whether he is going against god but that's a kind of uh, a touch of mockery is definitely there right so it's like asking our um, uh, the tamil actor kamala hasan is there god definitely he would give a different answer i think in the movie dasavdaram he gave a kind of a paradoxical uh, a contradictory statement kadal irukku nu solla matta irundha nalla irukum right that's a tamil dialogue uh, if we translate he says i don't say there is god uh, there is no god i'm only saying if there is one i'm happy see what is he saying kadal sorry kadal illa na solla matta so i'm not saying there is no god that's the first statement and the second statement what i'm only you now what i'm saying if there is god i would be happy so we are not sure whether kamala hasan in that movie or through this dialogue saying whether there is god or not god but pure you know we know that he is an atheist and we know that but in in socrates case we are not so sure what's happening here anyway with this we'll go to the next section section number 
do not harm birds subtitle or be cursed so when it comes to literature remember this whenever there is a bird it is not just a bird no it stands for you know it stands for some quality all right whether it can be spiritual or kind of uh, uh writing poetry itself right that's the first section and the second section third section remember if someone kills a bird in a piece of literature you now a character kills a bird that killing is kind of a curse for that character so killing a bird is a curse or considered a curse in any piece of literature it's a kind of a theme or a kind of a, you know motif right so let's go and check or a kind of an i would say from northrop fry the archetypal critics point of view an archetype Uh, a theme that comes again and again in literature let's go and when we think of that we think of the romantic poet samuel taylor coleridge and his poem the rhyme of the ancient mariner the opening poem uh in coleridge and wordsworth poetry collection 1798 lyrical ballads so what happens so initially the bird of course the not you know, generally the uh, the bird albatross is considered a bird of good omen so look at this so these lines so what happens we have the mariner and there are 200 sailors with him now their ship is stuck in ice they can't move and they are bothered about that i think they are stuck in south pole at that time a bird comes and it's a good omen so let's read the lines at length did cross an albatross through the fog it came now you can actually associate albatross with the dove we saw in the previous section dove represents you know uh, dove is a christian symbol and dove represents the holy spirit here albatross is more a bird of good omen and kind of a christian soul like a dove the holy spirit similar way at length did cross an albatross through the fog it came as if it had been a christian soul we hailed it in god's name so so far so good then what it does it ate the food it never had eat and round and round it flew the ice did split with the thunder fit so since it's a good omen now the ice which has been frozen and the stick sorry the ship is stuck but now the ice did split and now there is a relief and the ship has started moving the helmsman steered us through the trouble is over so when the poem starts the po- the you know coleridge makes use of the established symbol in the sense albatross a bird of good omen but in the later part of the poem or in the later part of section 1 or part 1 it turns into something else so here is a voice god save the ancient mariner so there is a voice which says mariner you are going to do something nasty beware from the fiends that plague the us why looks thou so so what happened something came over you know this guy the ancient mariner so what he did with my cross bow the voice switched to the his point of view he says with my cross bow i shot the albatross so this is how he kills kills albatross there is no reason you know we don't know why he did that it's not told in the poem but something came over him he shot the bird which was considered a good omen now a curse upon him and also the entire crew uh, you know for some time the crew condemned his act but later the crew of sailors they also said okay what you did was good then they were also cursed and all the 200 sailors die except him because he has to live life and death a kind of a torture and that's what happens to the ancient mariner 
and then comes that famous scene at the end of part one of this poem an albatross around one's neck now this phrase has entered the english language it's an idiom when we say an albatross around one's neck it's kind of a curse a uh, constant torture or something that has been troubling someone so what happens the soldiers i uh, sorry the sailors um you know they are sick of this uh, ancient mariner because of his act the cruel act of killing the good omen now something bad has happened again the ship is struck now it's stuck in ice now there is no food and of course the fair you know the famous words from this poem water water everywhere nor any drop to drink they are thirsty they are hungry they are desperate to move from this place but there is no albatross now so what they do this what they do oh well a day what evil looks had i from old and young instead of the cross the albatross around my neck was hung so what happens the ancient mariner was wearing a cross around his neck but the sailors of feel you do not deserve that you can't wear this cross which is holy but you committed a crime so you don't deserve this cross they remove the cross from his neck and in that place what they do they hung and the albatross he killed so it's more of his sin so here it assumes an another symbolic meaning earlier albatross a bird of good omen now albatross attains a symbolic value in literature because of coleridge so in literature when we say albatross albatross is a symbol of guilt a symbol of pain or symbol of one's sin and that's what it represents now all right so i'll go but anyway his curse was uh, was lifted in the later part of the poem when he blesses uh, water snakes when he blessed water snakes you know unknowingly in involuntarily then something happened you know the uh, curse was lifted in the sense he understood the value of a life at the end of the poem or uh, at the end of the journey then the curse was lifted so the earlier part of the poem he committed a sin in the later part of the poem he understood a value of a life any life for that matter whether it's a bird or a water snake so his curse was lifted but he was given a job in the sense he has to tell his tale to people so that you know he could wash off his sin so he goes ashore and he was saved by a hermit and two people then he saw three wedding guests going to a wedding and he stops one and he started telling his tale to that wedding guest and that's how the poem starts initially and now let's look at thomas hardy the victorian poet or the modern uh, sorry poet as well as novelist and this is by thomas hardy thomas hardy uh, says they are all ancient mariners in the sense all storytellers are ancient mariners why because the ancient mariner has a tale to tell and there are wedding guests they are going to the wedding they are in a hurry but the ancient mariner stops the wedding guest one of the wedding guests and he tells his tale because he thinks his tale has more power and it can change the life of that particular wedding guest similar way you know we literature students or storytellers we have something to tell to others and unless we have something solid we can't stop a wedding guest because people are in a hurry so that's what the entire quote is about so let's read a story must be exceptional enough to justify its telling right so there should be something in a story or else you know we don't to take others time or waste others time to tell a tale so we tell tellers are all ancient mariners and none of us is warranted in stopping wedding guests in other words the hurrying public unless 
he has something more unusual to relate than the ordinary experience of every average man and woman so if you want to write a story that should be something different even uh, i would say extraordinary ordinariness in human life so you should show something that we have never seen before or understood before so so yeah you know hardy was inspired by ancient mariner and we should also i'll go to the next one as i told you before when it comes to literature killing a bird is a kind of a bad omen and it's kind of an architect uh, a theme that comes again and again uh, let's go to the russian writer anton chekhov and his uh, play the seagull so what happens in this uh, play so you have the character constantin k o n s t a n t i n constantin who wants to be a playwright but he is not a successful one he's a failure he writes stories but it's not successful he tries to put on plays not successful and even in love he is not successful because he is in love with nina an actress but nina is in love with someone else another writer even uh, they stay together and she had a baby and the baby died and opening scene or uh, in the opening of the play constantin gave her an odd gift i mean a dead seagull so this is the dialogue constantin i was base enough today to kill this gull i lay it at your feet as if she were a goddess and he is sacrificing her uh, at at her feet you know all his love but it's a very strange sacrifice right so he is presenting her with a gull but he was very much aware that it was a base act a mean act to kill a bird but he did that he didn't know why or how but he did that it's like the ancient mariner and this is kind of a foreshadowing uh, in literature that he is also going to die there is no helping so nina asks what is happening to you and action she picks up the gull and stands looking at it and constantin after a pause so shall i soon end my own life so nina doesn't appreciate uh, doesn't you know uh, give back his love nina is more after someone else so constantin is adamant in love so he doesn't want to move uh, move on in his life so he is stuck in life it's like the ship in ancient marina so he says so shall i soon end my own life so a uh, two years pass you know pass by after two years again he meets nina now mina has sorry nina has given birth to a baby which died and uh, the the lover he uh, deserted her now nina is back she still believes she she could be a successful an actress but that doesn't happen you know but because of his despair in a constant uh, shoots himself and he dies so that's the end of the seagull a tragic one right but anyway what we focus on is that killing a bird is a sin in literature and killing a bird is a bad omen and similar theme we can find in uh, the norwegian playwright henrik ibsen who is considered the modern you know the father of modern drama so here is a play the wild duck so what happens in wild duck again we have um a something a different character here so we have grigers wall g r e g e r s grigers wall w e r l e grigers wall what's his problem you know grigers wall's problem he has some compulsion in the sense he cannot but tell truth i mean he cannot lie that that's his problem but the thing is when he you know he tells the truth he also you know uh, troubles people and he doesn't bother about the consequences 
So because of his truth telling, people die. And he also destroys a family. So that's what happens in this play, The Wild Duck. So in the beginning of the play, what happens? Uh, Grihar's world actually shot at a wild duck, which escaped, which was saved by a girl called, or the girl's family. A name of the girl, Hedwig, H-E-D-D-I-G, Hedwig. And she has, she is very fond of that bird, which is wounded and wounded by Grihar's ball. So Grihar's ball came back to the town and he had a friend called uh, Halmer, H-J-A-L-M-A-R, classmate, former classmate or schoolmate. Grihar's ball goes to his house and he even stays there. And he knows some truth. The truth is that Grihar's world's or Grihar's world's father's maid named Gina, G-I-N-A. Now that former maid is the is now the wife of his friend, Halmer. But there is a secret. Secret in the sense uh, Gina had an affair with the world's uh, Grihar's world's father, and she had a child. And the child is Hedwig. But he possessed this knowledge. He could have avoided that, you know, avoided telling this to the family. But he thinks a family cannot be, you know, found on, you know, can be based on lies. So he tells the truth to Halmer. Uh, Halmer doesn't love Hedwig and the problem starts. In the meantime, uh, Hedwig, uh, she thinks, okay, our uh, Grihar world says to, uh, Hedwig, see, if you sacrifice your wild duck, because once the father said, I'm going to kill that wild duck. I don't like that wild duck, but she's fond of that wild duck. She wants to win back his love, father's love. It's like um, uh, Shakespeare's King Lear and Cordelia. So it's like the tragic one, King Lear and Cordelia. So at the end of the play, Cordelia dies and we know the pain of uh, King Lear. Similar thing happens here. So Hedwig, the girl, allows uh, her grandfather to shoot the wild duck because the uh, grandfather thinks uh, he was a hunter. So now uh, sometimes he kills the animals in the loft. So that's what happens. And people think, okay, there's some shooting going on. But what happens at the end of the play, Hedwig, um, she commits suicide by shooting herself to death. So that's what happens. And she, she was under the impression, okay, I have nothing to lose now because my father no longer loves me. What is there for me to live? So this is what happens. Helmer asks, shoot the wild duck, what for? It hurts. She wanted to sacrifice to you the best thing she had in the world because she thought then you would have to love her again, but so that doesn't happen. So this is the end. Halmer, Gina, and Grigers drag Hedwig into the studio. Her right hand hangs down and her fingers curve tightly around the pistol. So now you can understand. So this is how, when we, when we read literature, how do we understand that something is an archetype? We should understand the pattern. You know, now we can understand killing a bird is no longer a simple act in any piece of literature. So this is how it acquired some significance and it, it turns into a symbol. Now, the bird is not just a bird here. It's a symbol of love or symbol of sacrifice or kind of misunderstanding, right? So it carries connotation. So this is how we can interpret any symbol in literature. So we'll go to the next one. So when we read uh, Hendrik Ibsen, the playwright who inspired uh, the Irish playwright and Nobel laureate um, Bernard Shaw, and also uh, he inspired Arthur Miller, the American playwright known for Death of a Salesman. So he inspired a lot of people and known for his, uh, uh, you know, social values. You know, no, known for uh, no, addressing social problems. So um, this is his another famous work, An Enemy of the People. 
I like this work, especially for the, the last words uh, by Dr. Stockman. So what happens here is a doctor, Dr. Stockman, S-T-O-C-K-M-A-N-N, Dr. Stockman, a kind of an inspector or an uh, official in a town. So what happens, the town's economy is based on spas or baths in that town. But the doctor finds out that the water in the spa, spa or the bath is contaminated. So he wants to report this or he wants, to, he, wa he wants to announce to the world that the bath is contaminated. But people are angry because they don't want the truth because the truth will destroy the livelihood. So they are against Dr. Stockman, but Stockman is more bothered about loss of lives. People may die because of this contaminated water. But what happens, the entire town, you know, ostracizes this man and they, you know, they torture his family and him and all the problems, but Stockman stands his ground. And this is uh, towards the end of the play. He says, the strongest man in the world is the one who stands most alone. So I stand for truth, right? So maybe, you know, if you look at it, uh, look at uh, the plays of Henry Gibson, it's more about truth, facing the truth or telling the truth, which kills a family or standing for truth. And uh, there is another work called brand, B-R-A-N-D. Brand means fire in uh, Norwegian. So it, ta it talks about a priest, a priest, who is known for his adamant nature, a priest who wants to lead people uh, to the path of God, path of spirituality. But his problem, he forget, forgets one thing that is essential to uh, you know, religion, that is to love, to love other people. So he forgets that. He, he forgets to love his own family, his wife, his dead child, and everything. Ultimately, he, he becomes a desperate soul without love. So that's the work is about. We'll go to the next one. So let's end this section with, you know, understanding. Say earlier, you might have looked at Ravana from uh, the epic Ramayana. So in Ramayana, now you can associate, you know, the killing of a bird with that archetype, a curse. So we are aware Ravana now abducted or kidnapped Sita, and he was attacked by a bird, Jarayu. And what happened, Jarayu is a big bird, very strong one. And it fought with Ravana. Ravana initially struggled, but he had a sword, Chandrahasa. And with that sword, he, you know, he just um, cut off the wings of that bird, Jarayu. It's like the ancient mariner, right? Or maybe ancient mariner came much later. So now we can understand killing a bird is definitely an archetype, which is there in the myth, is there in the epic and, and in literature. So this is how we identify, okay, this is an archetype, or this is a symbol, right? And this is what happens, right? So what happens, Jadayu, which is about to die, right, it meets um, uh, Rama and uh, Lashman, and it says to Rama and Lashman, your wife is abducted by the king Ravana. So go to you know, go south and find your wife, and that's how they. But anyway, we can in Tamil Nadu we look at Ravana as also a kind of an epic hero himself. So the fall of his his fall is more of his hubris. Maybe we can say. So thus fell the epic hero because he harmed a bird, right? And there is an alternative version to that story, the Ramayana. So we have a counter discourse by Pulavar Kulandai, poet, Tamil poet, who wrote the same epic from Ravana's point of view, Ravana Kavyam, which was banned when the book was published, it was banned. Then uh, now it's in circulation, we can read. So Pulavar Kulandai's Ravana Kavyam, it's from Ravana's perspective. Why he abducted Sita? Why he fought against Rama? So that's the work is about. We'll go to the next section. 
before that. So if you don't kill birds, you can save birds. So save birds and save the spirit. Let's end this section with the short story by the American writer, Sarah Own Jewett. Sarah, O-R-N-E, Own Jewett, J-E-W-E-T-T. -E and here is a short story, a white heron. A white heron, uh, I think this, this short story was introduced to me by a student while I was teaching at the University of Madras, um, Cherisha Agnes. So she, she introduced this short story to me and she actually uh, told the entire uh, story to me. So what happens, here is a girl, Sylvia in this story. She's poor and she's living with her grandma. And there comes a stranger, a hunter, who is after a white heron, which is rare. So he wants to kill the heron and he wants to stuff that bird and put it in his collection. So that's his aim. But he can't find any bird. He can't sight any bird. And now she stays with the grandmother as a lodger and he speaks with Sylvia and Sylvia understand, okay. And she tries to impress that stranger. But what happens? Yes, she goes in search of something, but a tree invites her. She climbs up the tree and she reaches the top of the tree, which wants you see uh, in the screen now on the cover page of that work. At the top of the tree, she looks at the entire valley and something, something happens to her. And she also looks at a nest and there are birds, you know, uh, babies and there is a white heron now she loves that family and she understands something you know the little girl and the little girl comes back and the stranger asks her today too i couldn't find any white heron did you spot any and it's a kind of a spiritual a kind of a crisis she needs money you know ten dollars uh, the stranger offers ten dollars uh, for the information and she can get the $10, she can get the, get his friendship. Maybe her grandmother can be happy with the $10 money. But she decides not to tell the location. And that's her decision. So that's what we look at here. She remembers how the white heron came flying through the golden air. And Sylvia cannot speak. She cannot tell the heron's secret and give its life away. So this is a reversal of the theme we have been looking at, killing a bird, but is a saving a bird. Since she saved a bird and its family, you know, she feels alive. Okay, I did something good and that saves her. And she's more happy with that, that feeling than the money. Okay, so let's do that. We'll go to section four. Birds of a feather brave the weather together. So it's a kind of a brotherhood or sisterhood or birdhood. Let's see. So we have Aristophanes, uh, the playwright was known for his comedies. So one of his plays, The Birds. So what happens in this play? So there is an Athenian named uh, Pistetarus, P-E-I-S-T-H-E-T-A-E-R-U-S, -E -E which means trusty. So he is an Athenian. He's fed up with you know, the politics in Athens and uh, its war against Sicily and uh, uh, other countries. So he wants to build a Ethiopian city and the name of the Ethiopian city, Nephalokokshia, N-E-P-H-E-L-O-K-O-K-K-Y-G-I-A, Nephalokokshia. But he can't build that city on his own. So he seeks the help of the birds. And with their help, he wants to build that city in midair between the heaven and the earth, right? And he wants to rule that. And finally, he rules that and he even be becomes the god of the entire universe. So this is more of a satire. Why? There is no direct hint at the war. Uh, Fellow Punisian war. Now, Athens war against 
Sparta and Sicily and other countries. And people are fed up with this war because many died and there are a lot of crises. And this place considered a political satire on that military expedition, okay? And we can also um, read about this, the Fenelopian War in uh, the Victorian poet, Arnold, Thomas Arnold's poem, uh, Dover Beach. Anyone? What's the last line of Dover Beach? Anyone remembers? Dover Beach? Uh, kind of an army, kind of an ignorance. I'm just giving you a clue uh, for that famous line, which is often quoted in English literature. The Dover Beach and its last line. Why the last line is important? Because the last line alludes to uh, the Fenelopian War, sorry, fellow Ponesian War. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. We have the famous line, where ignorant armies clash by night, right? Ignorant armies clash by night. That is a passage, you know, taken from a history book, right? By, uh, about uh, fellow Ponesian War. Okay, so that's the reference. But anyway, we have this utopia here, uh, like Thomas More's utopia. So Nephalogauxia, which means cloud cuckoo land. So translation. So they have built a land of their own with the help of birds in the clouds. So that's the uh, name, cloud cuckoo land. Then we go to another one, this time from the great, Persian poet Attar, A T T A R, Farid Udin Attar. Attar also means perfume, right? He might be a perfumer, we might not know. And his famous book, The Conference of the Birds. Attar was a Sufi, you know, uh, a philosopher, and it's a different one in Islam, a Sufi. And when we say a Sufi, a Sufi is a different one in the sense they try to understand their inner self. God is more within us. We try to find God within us, right? So this poem is a beautiful and an epic poem. This poem is about a group of birds and they have a problem. They need a king. They need someone to, an ideal ruler. They need an ideal ruler and they think they, they can find an ideal re, a ruler in the legendary bird called Simorg, S-I-M-O-R-G-H. And the birds, they need a guide. They choose a bird called Hupu, H-O-O-P-O-E. Now, Hupu is more of a spiritual leader here. And Hupu leads a group of birds. And he invites the birds to go on a journey, go on a quest to find the ideal ruler, legendary Simorg, right? kind of a god. Right? It's our spiritual journey. But the birds, initially, they are very vibrant and they want to go on this journey. But they have their own doubts, their own obsession. Maybe they say, one of the birds says, no, I live in a pond. I'm very much attached to the pond. You know, it's like uh, we are attached to material things. The bird is attached to its pond. And it doesn't want to come out of the pond and go on this journey. And when they start the journey, everyone comes up with an excuse and everyone has a problem. And every time they raise you know, a question, uh, they come up with an excuse. The spiritual leader, Hupu, tells a story, a kind of a parable or a fable. Then it ends with a moral and he motivates them and they start the journey. But by and by, by and by, you know, many leave except 30. 30 birds reach the destination and they are invited to the palace and the surprise in the sense they are asked to look at a mirror and they look themselves in the mirror and they understand the meaning of life or the spiritual, the end of spiritual journey. In the sense, you identify yourself, you look within because the mirror shows you are the leader, the self, and they understand the true meaning of simorg. C, S-I, means 30, morph, 
or mog m o r g h which means birds the 30 birds which reach the destination and they are the true rulers of their own sprit right they go in search of god but god is within you and you ultimately you have to find that i think that might be the essence of a sufism and this book was introduced to me by a friend named maimona who is also a sufi and when i was reading this book i stuck upon or i hit upon this idea of why not a lecture on birds you now symbolic representation of birds in literature and that is the birth of this a lecture so i have to dedicate this uh, lecture to maimona a sufi so with this we'll go to the next one and simor so what do you see on the screen a kind of a bird a mythical bird with a fox head and feathers peacock's feathers it's a mixture simog it's a mythical bird and we are also aware of another mythical bird called a phoenix which dies and rises again and again from its own ashes so let's go to phoenix now when we think of phoenix we think of uh, the metaphysical poet john dun and his famous poem the canonization so what happens in this poem so i would say more of birds of paradox so why paradox here because the title says when we say canonized someone is canonized mean means you confer sainthood on that person right like teresa mother teresa so the canonization talks about two things in the sense you know it argues for sainthood to be conferred on lovers but irony in the sense or paradox canonization is more associated with uh, spirituality whereas uh, lovers they are more associated with the sensuality so spiritual versus sensual and that's one of the essence of metaphysical poetry in metaphysical poetry they combine thought and feeling and also the spiritual and the sensual now let's look at the the you know the stanza given here the lovers say we are tappers that means candles we are tappers too and at our own cost die right we don't trouble the world we are uh, we live in our own world we die on our own we don't bother others and we in us find the eagle and the dove all right so this is where it, it seems innocent i mean the symbols the eagle and the dove we already know the dove is a spiritual symbol right the dove represents the holy spirit right we also saw the hawk here eagle it's also represents christ so it seems like spiritual journey all right and the phoenix riddle hath more wit by us we too being one or it so there is a claim by the lovers see we have solved the riddle of the phoenix how it dies and rises from its own ash so they have solved the middle, uh, riddle why because if you ought to be canonized there are certain rules one of the rules is that you have to have uh, done a miracle performed a miracle so if you haven't done any miracle i mean a saint or a priest you know can, uh, he or she cannot be canonized right so now the poet or the person of the poem is arguing for uh, that saintlyhood the lovers a saintlyhood so the lovers should have performed some miracle so this is their miracle so this is the odd comparison on the one side we have saints performing miracles on the other side we have the sensual lovers performing miracle let's see what their miracle is so then they say so to one neutral thing both sexes fit we die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love so in the first reading it seems innocent seems spiritual they are united the lovers are united in love it's a kind of a spiritual bonding but when we read for the second time it's not spiritual it also has some sexual connotation some sensuality is involved here let's read the poem again so when we look at the birds here the eagle and the dove they are not only spiritual also sensual because here 
the speaker is talking about the sexual intercourse between the lovers. So during their sexual intercourse, what happens? One acts like or one plays the eagle, very dominant, and another plays the dove, submissive. And they also switch the roles. The male plays the eagle and the female plays the dove, maybe initially. Then they switch their roles. The female plays, female is aggressive during the act. Eagle, she plays the eagle and the male plays the dove. So that is their union. And they find the aggressiveness and the submissiveness in each other. They are a perfect couple. There is com you know, uh, compatibility. And you know, they have to be compared with, uh, compared with saints and they have to perform some miracle. And this is their miracle. The Phoenix riddle, what's the riddle? How it you know, comes back again to life. So what happens? Uh, look at these two words, die and rise. Die, the word die is not an innocent word here. During the Elizabethan period, the word die has some other connotation. In the sense, it's not a physical death. It's the death of their sensuality. So during the sexual intercourse, they come down from their passion, the death of their physical passion. After a period of time, again, the passion uh, you no know, rises. So that's the meaning here. The die and rise the same. So die and rise in the same in the sense during their union, their sexual passion comes down. Again, it rises. So through their union, they have done some miracle. In the sense, they have shed their sexes. They are no longer male or female. They become one. As if they are one with God, they are one in love, both male and female. Right? They, there is no male or female, just one sex. I mean, gender here, neutral being, a neutral thing. And once the passion dies and it rises again, like a phoenix. So this is how they solve the phoenix riddle, right? So this is a poem. So a beautiful poem in a sense, it merges both spiritual and the sensual. So we find the, yes. So we have the new critic, Cleanth Brooks. So Cleanth Brooks in his essay, the language of paradox. He analyzed this poem, particularly this poem, John Ten's canonization, and Cleanth Brooks' famous essay collection, The Well Wrought Urn. The title taken from uh, Keats and also from Dunn, Dunn's canonization. So, what happens at the end of that poem? The lovers are preserved in, or their ashes are preserved in an urn because the ashes of saints are preserved in, in an urn. So similar way, their ashes are preserved in an urn and the urn is nothing but the sonnet or the poem itself, all right? So they have to be preserved in sonnets because we have the sonnet tradition, Shakespeare sonnets or other sonnet sequence. Generally lovers are preserved in sonnets. So same thing happens here, right? So let's look at the ashes of the phoenix. In the, in, the, in, the, in the sense, the lovers. Cleanth Brooks makes this bold statement. The language of poetry is the language of paradox. What does it mean? It means whenever we read something in literature and the same passage contains the reversal of, this, the reversal of the first meaning. For instance, the very word canonization, the title, the title says, it's more spiritual, but it's its opposite, the sensual. So that's a paradox. There are a lot of paradox here. Maybe the symbol itself is a paradox. The eagle is one and the phoenix, I mean, the dove is another, a kind of a paradoxical or contradictory birds, right? So Cleanth Brooks writes this, the urn to which we are summoned, the urn which holds the, the ashes of the phoenix is the well-wrought urn of John Dunn's canonization, the poem itself, which holds the phoenix lover's ashes. It is a poem itself, okay? I hope you remember new criticism when we looked at that in School of Criticism, okay. Let's go to another poem. Again, a group of birds, uh, this time from the father of English poetry, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. The Parliament of Fowls 
or the title is also called the Parliament of Birds. So what happens, uh, the poet has a dream and he has been reading something, he falls asleep and he wakes up and there is a conference of birds, a parliament of birds. What is that problem? Or there is a love suit. In a sense, three male eagles seek the love of a female one. So there is a, going to be a judgment. Nature is the judge. And everything happens on Valentine's Day, right? So the conference of birds. So it's on Valentine's Day. The three male lovers, I mean, male eagles, they, they tell their side of the story. And they say why each one of them, they say why they love or why their love is superior to the others, why they deserve the female one. But there are a lot of problems, a lot of dispute at the end of the dispute or end of the discussion. Nature says, okay, now we can't come to a decision. The decision should be left to the bird, the female bird. This eagle should make a decision, but it has to be given some time. So nature gives one year time to uh, the female one. The female one has a choice. So that is the essence of, I would say the essence of this uh, entire work. She is given a choice. She can choose her partner, a free will on her own, right? Kind of a room of one's own, a will of her own. She is not forced to marry someone by nature. Nature says, you have a will of your own, use it, but take some time and decide who, who you want to be with, right? So that's your decision. And we can trace the same theme or similar theme in uh, Chaucer's uh, story or tale, uh, the wife of Bath's tale in Canterbury Tales. In Canterbury Tales, we have wife of Bath who is known for her, uh, you know, spirit, uh, a dominant spirit and her free spirit. In, uh, maybe you can read the tale, wife of Bath tale. The tale is all about how, what, what do women like the most? And in that story or in that tale, we come to know uh, maybe that's the solution given by the author. What do women like the most? And the answer given in that work is they want to make their own choice. So that's the answer given there. Maybe you can agree with the poet or you can dispute. Okay. And let's look at a tale from Canterbury Tales, something with the birds. We have a, a fable, the tale, the nun's priest tale. What happens in this tale? Uh, we are all familiar with this tale. In Tamil, we also have a similar tale. We have a crow and, and the fox, right? The crow and the fox, similar tale. So what happens? Here is a fox named Sir Razal. And we have, you know, a pompous uh, a rooster named Chanticleer, C-H-A-N-T-I-C-L-E-R. Chanticleer is known uh, for its uh, proud nature and uh, it takes care of a lot of chicks literally here. So what happens? Russell wants to eat this Chanticleer, which is very proud. So Russell sneaks up and tells Chanticleer, Chanticleer, your father, your father was such a good one. He used to sing. He's such a good singer. I hope you can also sing and the world should listen to you. And Chanticleer, oh my God, once he's praised, he started singing and that's his fall. So our uh, fox, Russell, caught up him between his teeth and started running. So what happens, the farmers, they gave a chase. They tried to uh, save the bird, but they couldn't. Now the bird has to use its intelligence. Chanticleer has an idea. Chanticleer says, Mr. Russell, you are such a brave one. Why are you running away? You know, why are you afraid of these peasants? Why don't you turn back and shout to them? This is what you have to shout. Turn back again, you proud peasants all. And the foul pestilence upon you fall. And now Russell, his pride is pricked. And Russell, you know, just opens its mouth and it wants to shout back. And now our bird escapes and it 
it, it climbs up the tree and you know, that's the end of the story. So we have the similar, we have similar stories in, I, I hope in most literature, a bird which uses its intelligence and outwit the funny, you know, the foxy fox. Okay, so with this, we are ending section four and let's go to section five. The bird of wisdom, subtitle, Hoots for Social Freedom, H-O-O-T-S. And with this verb, you can understand what bird we are going to talk about, Hoots. Let's talk about owl. In literature or in myth, especially Greek and Roman myth, owl is a bird of wisdom, a symbol of knowledge. Why? Because it is associated with the Roman goddesses, Minerva, M-I-N-E-R-V-A. And she has owls, all right? And that's called the owl of Minerva. The owl of Minerva is known for its wisdom because it belongs to the goddesses of wisdom, Minerva. We can see this in literature. For instance, let's look at the Victorian writer, uh, Tonkre, William Macpiece Tonkre, and his famous work, his masterpiece, Vanity Fair. In Vanity Fair, we have two heroines, one Amelia Sidley, another Becky Sharp. In the opening scene, what happens, both Amelia Sidley, S-E-D-L-E-Y, Amelia Sidley, and Becky Sharp, Rebecca Sharp, they leave Miss Pinkerton's Academy for Young Ladies, right? So this is kind of a parting scene. And they are going to leave this academy. And when they leave, you know, it's uh, one who runs that academy is uh, Miss Pinkerton. She has this habit, a kind of a tradition. If someone leaves the academy, she presents them with a book. And the book is Dr. Johnson's Dictionary, uh, 1755. Uh, she signs that book. And because she is a friend of Dr. Johnson, and she always gives a book to anyone who leaves this academy. And Miss Pinkerton is very much uh, in awe of Miss uh, Amelia Sidley. She loves her so much, but she hates the other character, the major one in the novel, Becky Sharp. So she takes just a, a single, just a dictionary. She doesn't want to give another dictionary, waste a dictionary on Becky Sharp. But Miss Pinkerton has a sister, Jemima. Uh, she is humble and she wants to present uh, her own copy of Johnson's Dictionary to Becky Shaw, a poor girl, an orphan. Whereas Amelia Sidley, she is a bit rich. So here is a description of Miss Pinkerton. This is how the narrator describes her. That pompous old Minerva of a woman could not see from the difference of rank and age between her people and herself. Uh, you know, she can't really understand Amelia Sidley and her good nature, okay? So that's the description. And she actually stays in Minerva House. There is a house called Minerva House in that academy, uh, Miss Pinkerton's Academy, okay? So now when we read this uh, description, only, you no. Know, if we are aware of this connotation or symbolism, Minerva is an owl which represents wisdom or also here a pompous one because she is a teacher, right? Miss Pinkerton. If we are aware of that, then we read something else. We read more into this passage or else we'll just read and let it go. Old Minerva of a woman, that's all. It's actually a metaphor, right? So it's a place of knowledge, Miss Pinkerton's Academy, but it's not just about wisdom because Amelia Sidley is more wise. She's wiser than uh, Miss Pinkerton. And there's also the other side. The other side is that it's also a flop because we have another character, Becky Sharp, the round character. Anyone remembers who called Becky Sharp a round character? a person who wrote a work in which he talked about flat characters and round characters. And a round character is one which evolves in a piece of literature, all right? And it goes on and on. Ian Foster's aspects of novels. 
beautiful. E, uh, yes, E. M. Foster's aspects of the novel. So in that work, he introduced the terms, the flat character and round character. For flat character, we have Mrs. Macabre from Dickens' novel. For round character, he gives Becky Sharp as an example, Becky Sharp from Vanity Fair. And in the opening scene, Becky Sharp is hurt because she was hurt by Miss Pinkerton, but that's not the reason for her to hurt her sister, Jemima, because Jemima truly loves this girl and she gifts her a book, Johnson's Dictionary, but what she does is she throws back, you know, Johnson's Dictionary back into the garden and she goes away with her friend, Amelia Sidley to her house, Amelia Sidley's house. So that's the opening scene of this one. Then there are a lot of uh, love triangles and love problems. And finally, there's a change of heart in Becky Sharp. That's, uh, that's happened towards the end of the work, okay? So if you're interested, please read the work. And now let's go to the war poet, Edward Thomas and his poem, The Owl. Here, owl is a different owl. It's an, yes, it's a bird of wisdom, but as we know, knowledge sometimes can trouble us. So here is a poem. It's about a soldier who is still alive, whereas uh, his fellow soldiers died in the war. He escaped, he survived. So he has this survivor guilt or survivor's guilt and that troubles him. So World War I, the poem talks about World War I and its atrocities. So we have a nocturnal cry of the dead. Let's look at some of the lines. Then at the inn, I had food, fire and rest, knowing how hungry, cold and tired was I. All of the night was quiet, barred out, except an owl's cry, a most melancholy cry. So there is peace. Now the war is over. He has survived. He has come out of the field. He is staying in an inn. Uh, he is no longer hungry. Everything is satisfied, but still he hears the owl's cry because here the owl's cry represents the cry of the dead, which is melancholic. So shaken out long and clear upon the hill, no merry note, nor cause of merriment, but one telling me plain what I escaped and others could not. So that's what troubles him. You know, he feels guilty that I survived whereas my brothers uh, died in the war. Maybe this uh, soldier suffers from cell shock. Uh, people suffered that day. And that night as in I went. So throughout his life, he's going to hear this cry of the dead. So this is what happened to soldiers who survived uh, the World War I. And these are some of the World War I poets. We have Richard Aldington, Edmund Blunden, Rupert Brooke, then Wilfred Wilson Gibbon, Robert Graves, Wilfred Owen, a major poet, a famous one, then Isaac Rosenberg, then Siegfried Sassoon, right? When Wilfred Owen met Sassoon, you know, in a hospital, you now he was inspired to write poetry. Uh, and he, there are a lot of poems, but some of the best poems, and one among them is Mental Cases, you know? People can't understand why these soldiers went mad. And this poem is about them. Wilfred Owen's Mental Cases. Let's read a line, a few lines. Dawn breaks open and look at the simile since a war poet, a war poem. Dawn breaks open like a wound that bleeds afresh. Here is a guy who is mentally disturbed. Whenever he looks at dawn, he is reminded of the wound and the blood in the field. Thus, their heads bear this hilarious, hideous, awful falseness, falseness of set smiling corpses. In the sense, they are living dead. They are like zombies. They are dead. They are, they are actually corpses, but still they are alive. They gone mad. And they are they are always a kind of a set smile. They always laugh to themselves, and that's how. People look at them, mad people, okay? And if you want to read um, Wilfred Owen's another famous poem, Dulce a Decorum Est. 
it's a Latin phrase. Uh, in Latin phrase, it means sweet and fitting. What is sweet and fitting? To die for one's nation. So to die for one's nation, to sacrifice yourself for to save one's nation, that is sweet and fitting, a reward. And which was questioned by Wilfred Owen in that poem of the same name, Dulce a Decorum Est. And let's end this section with the owl. The owl, or the owl, is the name of the novel by the Tamil writer, Cho Dharman. And it's also translated in English, published by Oxford, Kugai. So in Tamil title, Kugai, and it's translated into the owl. But Kugai, you can't say owl. I mean, in the sense, Kugai is an old Tamil word. It has some uh, kind of... Um, history to it. Now it uh, assumes history in a sense, it represents history, not assumes, it represents history. When we say Kugai, it's an old word in Sangam. It, it is used in Sangam literature, Tamil Sangam literature. So it has some history. Similar way, the, the novel is about Dalits and their struggle and they have Owl as their God in this particular work. So here, owl is not simply an owl. It's a metaphor for the Dalits and their struggles. And it also tells their story. The owl is more of a historian here. That's why I think maybe the writer has chosen this word, kuhari, instead of the another ordinary word, andai. That's an ordinary one. Both means owl, but this had some history to it. So he might have chosen that this word for that reason. And also this kuhari, is a witness to all the atrocities uh, done to the oppressed. So here, the owl is more of a symbol of a hoot of the oppressed because it records their history, it records their suffering, and it also lets out a cry of resistance. They're not going to yield that easily. They are going to fight back. So very symbolic. I enjoyed reading this novel. It was translated uh, by Vasanta Surya. Uh, translation, initially I had some problem with the reading, uh, this translation, because it's not exactly in the sense of, uh, you know, typical English translation. Uh, the translator ha had done something different in the sense he tried to, um, uh, the translator tried to uh, capture the essence of Tamil syntax and other things and the locality and the essence, the, the language spoken there. So he has done something to with the English language and this translation reads beautiful uh, or awkward, but it conveys the essence. So that's what uh, uh, the target of, that should be the target of the translator. And in that case, Vasant Surya has done a good job. So let's go to another section, section number six, a literary aviary, A-V-I-A-R-Y, it's a, um, Enclosure for birds. So subtitle for poetical plumagery. Plumage means uh, feathers. So let's look at some of the um, best poems and birds represented in literature. So we have uh, the madman, I mean, who is often called Matt Shelley. So P.B. Shelley's poem, O to a Skylark. So he calls that bird blithe sprit, in a happy bird. Blight sprit, which inspires him. And let's uh, read these lines. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. One of the most beautiful lines written, in, uh, written during the Romantic Age. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Sometimes we seem happy or we have to look happy for others, like a comedian or like a teacher or a lecturer. Yes, we go to class, we forget things, we tell tales, we look happy. But there are sad things, there are a lot of things happening to them, but they have to put everything aside and deliver the lecture. Let's go to the next one. So we have Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the nighting girl. He calls this the most musical bird. What happens in this poem? 
we have Samuel Taylor Coleridge and we have Wordsworth and Wordsworth's sister Dorothy. The three, they are all friends. They go and the person of the poem or speaker of the poem or Coleridge himself, he talks about Nightingale. How people generally associate this bird with melancholy, sadness. But the writer says, or the persona says, no, this bird cannot represent melancholy. It represents happiness. People misunderstand this bird because they associate a uh, nighting girl with a character. Anyone remembers that uh, Greek character um, who was kidnapped and raped and she was turned into a bird, which is a, a famous story about a king and his wife and the wife has a sister and the king goes and uh, you know goes and get the sister back so that uh, his wife can be happy but on the way back he falls in love with that girl sister and he abducts her and he cuts off her tongue he tortures her philomela and, yes you got that philomela yes philomela so whenever we think of nightingale we think of philomela and her tragic story because she was turned into a nightingale in one version. In another version, she is uh, turned into some other bird. So whenever we think of nightingale, we think of that sad incident, right? But Coleridge says, don't do that because we read such things into this beautiful bird. It's not melancholy at all. So that's his contention because in nature, nothing can be melancholy. So that's uh, one. And hark, the nightingale begins its song most musical, most melancholy bird. A melancholy bird, oh, idle thought. He doesn't believe that. In nature, there is nothing melancholy. But some night wandering man whose heart was pierced with the remembrance of a grievous wrong. Maybe someone you know, who faced injustice, maybe a person who wants to take revenge, maybe that kind of a person can see melancholy in this bird, otherwise there is no melancholy in this bird, which is the most musical bird. And towards the end of this poem, uh, he addresses his son, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Hartley Coleridge, his son. Uh, he also addresses his son in another poem, all right? So this poem is a famous one, uh, a babe uh, yeah, is actually talking about his son. He wants his son to appreciate this song and enjoy this song, hardly called rich. Okay, so we'll go to the next one. Now, yes, when we talk about birds, we should talk about Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, one of my uh, favorite poems of all time. Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. So whenever I read this poem, I find myself in this poem and uh, I want to come up with a different interpretation. So while I was reading this poem, I was also reading uh, Poe's another short story, uh, The Pit and the Pendulum. The Pit and the Pendulum is all about a torture chamber in which we have a sharp razor coming down and down, by and by. And it's a torture chamber. There is a person who is strapped to the board at the bottom. And he suffers because every time the pendulum, which has a sharp edge, knife edge, which swings here and there and it lowers, it comes down, down and down. So the person who is strapped to, you know, to that you know, board or the chamber is anxious. You know, he wants to die quickly, but this is a torture because he knows he's going to die, but this is eternal torture, right? But anyway, in that uh, short story, he escapes at the end. But when we read that, I think we can interpret the raven in a different way. We know the story of the raven. So we, all, we already looked at um, uh, Rossetti's uh, poem, The Blessed Damsel, right? Which is inspired by, or inspired from this poem. So what happens in this poem, we have a student, a scholar uh, who has lost his lady love now he's trying to study who is in his uh, study chamber, uh, study room and winter outside. It's uh, a rainy and comes a bird, the raven. 
and he tries to or he's, he tries to get some an answer from the raven because uh, raven is a bird bird from the hill right from hades so that's a myth we have so we also have a god called odin o d i n uh, from whose name we get the word wednesday odin then we get the word wednesday from this name so odin had ravens maybe the ra that ravens inspired po and that's a symbolic meaning here so what happens the raven comes it sits uh, it sits on the pallas of athena the pallas of athena i mean uh, she represents wisdom whereas this bird which is black in color whereas pallas athena the bust the it is made of marble which is white in color so we have the visual contrast white and black and symbolically a uh, pallas of athena represents wisdom whereas and this bird represents a uh, kind of uh, not wisdom not ignorance to kind of a superstition so we have the persona the scholar whose lady love is dead who is no more so he believes in superstition like dr fastus he tries to read you know uh, books on necromancy so that's how the poem starts then we understand actually is a torturing himself he can't come to terms with the dead of his lady love maybe we can understand this feeling if someone ditches you or someone they love so much and is and they go back on their words and say no i don't love you actually i said i said something else sorry and we get that then we feel oh my god it's a kind of a betrayal and the same thing here you know the death the premature death of the lady love is a betrayal and a kind of a survivor's guilt here and he speaks to the raven maybe we don't know whether there is a real raven there or it's his own imagination or a kind of um, hallucination we don't know but that's a torture then we understand the raven functions like the grand inquisitor who is a grand or who was a grand inquisitor a kind of a judge during inquisition spanish inquisition the darkest period in christianity where uh, one who goes against god one who talks ill about god or one who follows other religions uh, they are burned to death right at stake burned at the stake so that's a dark period so they have they had a judge and the name of the judge is the grand inquisitor right so the raven i would say functions like the grand inquisitor right it has to pass judgment and we understand here is a case and maybe we have uh, the student right now his case he wants to know about lenore his dead love who is dead he wants to know something about her because he thinks the raven can give some Conso no, or solace, uh, some consolation, right? So look at the description here. So it's more like a summoning, as if he is summoned to the court, all right, by the Raven, the Inquisitor, as though summoned to stand trial for the premature death of his beloved Lenore. The lover wheels a cushioned she seat in front of the bird and sinks into it. So this is more of a court scene. and look at the bird the bird is sitting on the top of a bust of uh, uh, pallas athena so the raven is more of a, a a grand inquisitor a judge now we have a criminal one who survived the death of his lady love all right now there is a case so what's the judgment so i would say this is the judgment self torture so that's his punishment like uh, uh the suffer you know the suffering went through by the ancient mariner so you can read this short story and this poem parallelly you can do a parallel reading of i would say a post pit and pendulum on one side on the other side you can read the raven then you can come up with a, an interesting interpretation i came up with this um, i would say i stumbled upon this interpretation so i thought i should capture this in a single sentence and uh, as you know you can look at the picture look at uh, uh, on the right side 
we have a picture, a famous picture, where Raven is sitting on the top of uh, Pallas Athena, behind which we have a light, and the shadow of the Raven falls on, you know, we have the student or the lover, and that is the end of uh, the poem. The shadow engulfs the entire thing in the sense he can't come out of his despair, right? He's so much into his despair, you know, the loss of love, he can't come out of his grief. So he's torturing himself. He has built a torture chamber for himself in his own mind. So I think that's the essence of this poem. And let me try to convey that in a single sentence. Okay. So I would say, what is the judgment given by the raven? Only one word sentence. Sentence here means punishment, right? Word sentence, it's a word play. The one word sentence, never more. You will never get relief in your life. Or there are a lot of meanings. A refrain which comes again and again, and it has a lot of meanings. So let's read the sentence. The one word sentence, never more, accentuates the sorrows of lost love by continually dissenting. In the sense, we can compare that one word. The one word is more like a razor blade, the swinging pendulum in the uh, tail, pit and the pendulum. So it comes down again and again because the bird utters that one word again and again and again, repetition. Similar way in the tail, we have you know, the pendulum coming down, swinging sharp, down and down. Each time it comes down, there's pain. Similar way, each time the bird utters, never more, rhyming with Lenore, then there is some problem. So like a razor shot pendulum upon the lover who is strapped, like in this story, the prisoner is strapped, right, to that bird. Here, the lover is strapped to his memory of the dead maiden and confined to his chamber of unending despair. I would say the poem is all about self-torture. The lover uh, couldn't come to terms with the loss of his lady love. Okay, so with this, we'll go to the next one. Another representation, when we think of birds or when we think of representation of birds or animals in literature, definitely we think of the British poet, Ted Hughes, uh, whom we call the animal poet. And one of his famous poems, hawk roosting. Roosting in the sense you rule, a ruler. So here is a bird which acts like a tyrant. It says, the sun is behind me in the sense I'm more, you know, I'm more powerful than the sun itself. The sun is behind me. Nothing has changed since I began. My eye has permitted no change. I'm going to keep things like this. So here the hawk behaves like a tyrant and a king, right? Next. But on the other hand, so when we think of the animal poet, uh, Teddy House, we can also think of the Canadian poet, E.J. Pratt. I would say he is also an animal poet with a difference in the sense, when we read E.J. Pratt's poem, you know, he not only talks about the animal world, he also talks about the clash between the animal world and the machine world. The world of the machines, clash with or clashes with the world of animals, birds. And maybe in order to understand this, let's uh, look at this poem, Dying Eagle. So like Tedious Hawk, here is a tyrant, a monarch. We have an eagle, but it's old. Now he has a competitor, an invader. The eagle says, the eagle stared at the invader, marked the strange bat-like shadow moving in leagues over the roofs of the world, across the passes and moraines, darkening the vitriol blue of the mountain lakes. See, so far is a rule. No one questioned his rule. He is a monarch of all he sees. But what happens? Today, something happened. Someone, a kind of an invader, who passed through his, his territory or territory in American pronunciation. So he said territory or territory. And the thing is, it didn't stop and salute this monarch. 
it just went through the territory he is insulted and he feels sad his monarchy is questioned his power is questioned now this dying monarch feels sad because here is an invader who is more powerful than himself and we come to know it's an airplane or aeroplane so the aeroplane is the invader which invades the space of of the birds especially here the eagle so this is egypt prat egypt prat is known for this kind of uh, merging uh, the space animal space and the machine space are the clash of both so it's more of a turf war and when we think of a hawk we can also think of hamlet hamlet's the favor uh, one of his uh, famous words so when rosencrantz and guildenstern's turn were sent to spy on hamlet hamlet immediately finds out they are spies and hamlet says i am but mad north north west when the wind is suddenly i know a hawk from a handsaw what is its meaning simple he says you are a handsaw guildenstern and rosencrantz both of you you are handsaw what is a handsaw and how does it differ from a hawk a bird it's a being and a bird is majestic a hawk it has a mind of its own it can make a decision of its own whereas you have a hand saw which needs someone to act upon it right it doesn't have a mind of its own it's more of a puppet so that's what hamlet is implying a guildenstern you are just a puppet in the hands of king claudius so i am aware of that okay so that's how so symbolically is conveying the message and when we think of birds we should, we are always remember this guy uh, icarus the greek myth in greek mythology we have this famous character icarus whose father daedalus and they try to escape and with the uh, wax wings and daedalus the matured artist gives a warning to his son icarus icarus you should not go too near to the sun or too near to the ocean because you will fall the ocean may suck you in or the sun may melt your wings but we have icarus and icarus once he gets the wings it's not wings of poesy but wings of uh, wax made of wax he goes to the sun and he flies towards the sun and it's melted it gets melted and he dies then one you know it gets a positive connotation or negative connotation positive connotation uh, icarus stands for ambition icarus stands for passion you have to go after your dreams no matter what another connotation it's your pride because your pride you are going to fall so uh, let's look at two poems which represents that so we have a uh, tetheus crow c r o w so it's more of a fable here he decided to attack it he represents crow it represents the sun here he decided to attack it and defeat it but the sun brightened it brightened and crow returned charred black so that's how crow became black so that's his fall because of its pride next uh, the famous allusion we have in uh, christopher marlowe's dr fastus so in dr fastus we have this kind of a, a symbol dr fastus is compared to icarus both are known for their vanity so his waxen wings did mount above his reach so here we are talking about dr fastus but the lines allude uh, allude to icarus all right then when we think of icarus and daedalus we also think of uh, a novel where we have uh, stephen daedalus and we have this famous novel a portrait of the artist as an young man right by james joyce similar problem whether stephen stedelis like uh, gm hopkins whether he is going to be a priest or a poet whether he is going to be a matured artist like stephen stedelis or the fall or the fall of icarus or stephen stedelis so that's the open ending of that novel we'll go to the next one and when we think of birds we also think of byzantium by 
the Irish poet W.B. Yeats. And in this poem, we have an old man, the earlier poem, sailing to Byzantium. Now he has reached Byzantium, the ideal city, but the city is not perfect. We have uh, um, drunkards, we have prostitutes, we have other dead souls. Uh, is impure, is yet to be pure, now yet to be cleansed. So what happens here in Byzantium, your soul is cleansed of impurity. Then you go, you travel on dolphins to the another city, right? So this is more of a stopping point. It's not the end. Uh, Byzantium is not the end, is not the final destination. It's only a stop. From, uh, from this place, your soul is cleansed. You go through fire, like uh, Buddha's fire, you are cleansed and you go to the next stage. So that is Byzantium. So in this city, we have everything is, uh, uh, seems perfect, but no, it's not perfect. But anyway, that is one thing that is crafty. We have miracle bird or golden ha no, handiwork. More miracle than bird or handiwork planted on the starlit golden bow. So we have a golden bird here. And the golden bird represents artist, uh, perfection of in art, right? So that's the symbol uh, we have here, and it's craft or or, cra or any craftsman or craftswoman it represents. Then when we think of birds, we think of this little bird, hermit thrush. So so many so many points have represented thrush. We have Thomas Hardy and his poem, the darkling. Thrush, D A R K L I N G, darkling thrush. So in this poem, the thrush is a symbol of hope. The poem is similar to uh, T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland. There is no hope. Uh, everything is barren. Europe is barren. But there is only one hope, and the and that is the thrush, an aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast. Be ruffled plume had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So gloom is a despair. So there's only one hope and we hear the music from thrush. Then again, we hear music um, in a sense, uh, Ted Hughes poem, Thrushes. Now the poet wonders how tiny a bird, we have a thrush here, but in this little head, it has a Mozart's brain. Mozart's brain had it because Mozart, the, the famous musician, is known for coming up with original music. And here is a bird which had or which has Mozart's brain, maybe Ilai Raja's brain or A. R. Rahman's brain, our Madras Mozart. Then um, in uh, Whitman's poem, Walt Whitman's poem, the American uh, poet, uh, it is an elegy. When lilacs lost in the dooryard bloomed. So in this poem, thrush is more a uh, symbol of mourning, mourning the death of Abraham Lincoln. Solitary the thrush, the hermit withdrawn to himself, avoiding the settlements, sings by himself a song. So nature is mourning for the death of Abraham Lincoln and nature is represented by thrush here. So with this, we come to the last section of uh, today's lecture, section seven. Swans sing sweet, subtitle. So just tap your feet. So when we think of swan, when we think of swan, we have, uh, uh, think of the Greek myth. So in Greek mythology, we have Zeus who takes the form of the swan and rapes a girl called Lida. And because of this act, this vulgar act, uh, Lida gives birth to Helen of Troy. I mean, Helen. And this is kind of uh, foreshadowing. See, Zeus, you know, brutalized this girl. And Helen, the offspring of Lida, she is going to destroy this world or Troy, the entire city. So this is a different take by W.B. Yeats. Then, Lida, sorry, Lida and the swan. So it talks about the rape of Lida and the fall of Troy. So a shutter in the loins engenders here. So simple line, it talks about the rape. 
a shutter in the loins engenders there. So Lida was raped by uh, Zeus in the form of this man. The broken wall and the burning roof and tower, so the tower of Ilium, as we found in uh, Dr. Faustus, and Agamemnon dead. So there will be casualties. So it's more of a foreshadow, kind of an evil one, kind of an omen. So something bad is going to happen because she's raped. So violence begets violence here. So being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, you know, representing uh, the swan, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent peak could let her drop? So in the scene, so it's a violence because uh, with its peak, it's a torturing the girl and raped by the uh, swan. So because of this violence, the world has to face a catastrophe and that is Troy and the fall of Troy. Then uh, we come to, again, we come to the symbolist poet, the French poet, Charles uh, Baudelaire, uh, his famous poem, uh, Lucinia. Lucinia means uh, the swan in French, L-E, C-Y-G-N-E. Lucinia means the swan. So here, the swan is a symbol of metamorphosis, change. In the sense, here is a swan in the city of Paris, and it is not in its own place. The swan used to be in a, a rural side, countryside. It used to enjoy a lot. Now it has migrated. Now it is in the city of uh, Paris, but, and Paris is changing. A lot of things are changing here. It's homesick. The bird is homesick and that's the poem. Whether we can accept this change in the world or happening in Paris, or we can't, or the change around us. But anyway, uh, whether the bird is able to adapt to this situation or not. So let's read some lines. Restlessly bathed his wings in the dust. See, instead of bathing his wings in water, now it's full of dust in Paris. And cried homesick for his fair native lake. So it says, rain, when will you fall? Thunder, when will you roll? Paris changes, but not in my melancholy has stirred, but there is no rain. So it has to accept the reality. So this is city. Next. Then next we have, uh, uh, again, the Nobel laureate, uh, W.B. Eight's famous poem, the wild swans at cool, C-O-O-L-E. So we can compare this poem with the uh, Wordsworth daffodils. So in daffodils, the poet saw at a single glance, 10,000 flowers. So similar way, here is a poet who saw a lot of swans on the lake. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and 50 swans, but he's able to count nine and 50, around 59 swans. Their hearts have not grown old, passion or conquest, wander where they will and attend upon them still. So here is a person who is inspired by the beauty and the passion of these swans. And we are also reminded of the famous uh, short story, or uh, children's tale from Hans Christian Andersen's uh, tale, The Ugly Duckling. So we know this story, right? Uh, we have a duck which gives birth to a lot of chicks and one among them is strange right, which is awkward, uh, which is not accepted by the group because it is different. And at the end of the story, we come to know that it's, it's actually not ugly. It turns out to be a swan, not just a, a, some ordinary bird. So it's more of a blessing in disguise. That's how God, you know, surprises this uh, little bird. And what happened towards the end of the story, we see but what did he see in the clear stream below? His own image, no longer a dark gray bird, ugly and disagreeable to look at, but a graceful and beautiful swan. So really a blessing in disguise and it's happy. Uh, it's happy. Next. And let's look at some of the legends associated with the uh, swan. So we have this Greek legend in this, in a, means a kind of a belief 
there is a belief that god of music apollo his soul passed into a swan when he died similar way we have uh, the greek philosopher and mathematician pythagoras so pythagoras believed that the souls of poets also passed into swans that's his belief he he thought okay poet if poets die you know their souls uh, pass into swans and even plato plato claimed that socrates you know before his death heard the song of a swan these are some of the myths associated with the, the swan and of course we are also you know we also looked at the swan the sweet swan of avon so it's associated with the poets and we have a phrase called swan song it's a literary term and we know it's again an ancient belief that the swans before they die you know they let out the most beautiful song right uh, in its entire life in their entire life before they die they sing a sweet song a kind of swan song so when we say swan song uh, it, uh, you know it's the most beautiful work or the most beautiful one it so now this term has some literary connotation when we say swan song in literature we mean an author's last piece of work before his or her death that's their last sweet music so let's look at an angry young man john asburn and his swan song teja vu uh, french title teja vu but here teja vu is a single word right uh, that's how he has written that work so go and check out teja vu and it's a sequel to which play find out and with this let's in today's class and today's class let's end with a french movie one of my favorite movies uh, french movies uh, if you want to watch this movie uh, it's a, a translation of the title spread your wings that's the name of the movie in english i mean english title spread your wings a french title donnez moi des ailes i mean give me your wings or maybe that's the title very beautiful movie you know it's based on research um, it's based on a true story how they try to save birds so sometimes we are fed up with this uh, eco criticism why because it has its own drawbacks when we go for eco criticism you know we always end up saying okay save birds save trees it's not concrete i hope if you are working on eco criticism i think uh, uh, this would be a good movie to watch and definitely this will help you because it's based on research based on true life and definitely you will enjoy the movie the movie is also good okay so with this we in uh, today's class thank you so much uh, for listening to this lecture so uh, you know in the upcoming weeks or uh, next month definitely we will go for few more lectures based on symbols so for, so far we have finished uh, uh, three lectures lecture 1 a general lecture on symbols or symbolism in literature and followed by representation of fish in literature which we titled uh, something fishy and this is uh, today's lecture uh, winged creatures next we will go for animals or symbolic representation of animals in literature so i am working on that soon i will deliver that lecture in the meantime you go through this lecture and the previous classes and your notes because when it comes to net exam you know remembering things all the things is tough but i think this method of teaching will help you remember a lot of things and there is also an advantage you know i can teach poem uh, poems short stories um tales novels uh, plays anything under the world and i i can also take you across countries whether it's england or norwegian or norway or anything else so that's an advantage we have with this method and let's um, have few more lectures based on this method so animals is almost ready and i'm also planning to deliver lecture on ship representation of ship in literature and train in literature uh, two lectures i'm planning and i also have few more so let's hope i try to come up with something interesting and beautiful thanks for listening uh, have a good day thank you sir thank you so much see you uh in my notes uh, you know sometimes uh, you do not have all these things in my 
uh, notes. We, you have you are provided with the ten books. You know, one for poetry, one for drama, one for novel, and everything. Uh, for thing, uh, sometimes I come up with fresh lectures which uh, I am yet to uh, write in my notes. So this is the one you have, right? <laughs> so you have to wait for my lectures. Maybe for the next batch, I will include all these lectures in the form of notes in my original notes. I will try to do that. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, have a good day. See you.